welcome to episode five of the Just Run podcast. So first of all, I want to start this episode by thanking everybody who has listened to the previous four. Um, if you didn't get a chance to listen to last week's with Sophie, please head over and check it out. You will not be disappointed. Uh, she's a trail runner, respected sports physio, an ultra coach, and it was a really informative fun episode we talked about everything from recovery to erections trust me you'll have some fun <laughs> um, uh, one other thing we announced last week as well was our first competition which is with our friends over at mad running junkies where you can be in for a chance to win you and a running buddy a free entrance to the hateful eight race which is a continuous eight mile loop until you drop basically so all you need to do is like and follow Just Run Podcast and the Mad Running Junkies. Tag your running buddies and we'll announce the winners on the 23rd of Feb. But this week, a little bit of a change. We're going straight into uh, the podcast with our very special guest. And um, yeah, we're going to be talking to endurance athlete Lewis Roglin. So Lewis, I know you're there. How are you doing, mate? Yeah, very well. Thank you very much. Um Thank you for having me on. I'm excited to get uh, yeah to get stuck into the weeds a little bit. <laughs> yeah, be good. Be good to have a chat for anybody who doesn't know Lewis. Uh, got a very long list of accomplishments. I'm not going to cover off everything, so forgive me if I miss anything, Lou. But uh, an ex professional rugby player, uh, plant based ultra runner, running coach, big moose ambassador, founder of Why We Run, a, an amazing five D, uh, 250 kilometer ultra event that we've not really stopped talking about since the <laughs> first episode if i'm being honest but um yeah it'd be good to have a chat with you Lou, and catch up i know um just touching on it briefly me and you met in well for the first time at the uh that really good motivational uh speaking evening that uh you and nathan spoke at big yeah. moose a few months back that was really cool um, that was a good night that wasn't it Really great night. I love I love the life stories evenings at Big Moose. Really inspirational. It's um they've done it for a few years now, and it, and honestly, it's uh yeah the 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 diversity of guests they had speaking, the different stories, the honesty and the vulnerability. It's really kind of inspired a lot of what I'm doing now. So like those those evenings have a real special place, um, mm. in in my heart. I think um, they're brilliant. Yeah, I agree. I mean, Nate, you're a big obviously a big advocate for it as well, aren't you? You you spoke at it obviously, and um. They came along and it was yeah, such a good evening. I mean, I, I always, if, I've said this since the start, like I came along and I didn't know what I expected, um, but um, I left it very inspired and very humbled. It was a brilliant evening. And it also opened my eyes up to more about Big Moose because I feared a hell of a lot about them. And, you know, I, I go to the cafe regularly and everything, but I just didn't know, I'll be in truth, it was probably just being ignorant. I didn't know how much they did. Um mm. And they've just, just since doing this, since like the beginning of January, we've already had a, fruit, a few friends reach out to us. Um, no names mentioned at this stage, but obviously just, just to put in their partners forward for therapy and stuff, and they've had help through Big Moose. So, I mean, if we can do that with just one person, that's, we're setting out exactly to do what we achieved. So, yeah, really yeah, inspiring. It was awesome because like um, the day after, I, th I expect you got it as well, a message off um Chloe about so like how many people had signed up just as a result of that night and he really touched home that just us being vulnerable stood in front of a handful of people and really helped someone to like reach out themselves and get a help, uh, which was which was fantastic really. Um yeah. just for like forty minutes of well stood there getting our heart and soul out I suppose. Um mm. Yeah, it was it, it was quite a strong night for me, and uh, yeah, it's been home outlook of like why I'm running, I suppose. Yeah, it was it's good. Kind of, it's kind of the like for like as to like doing that hard thing, right? Opening yourself up, being vulnerable. This is a little bit similar to an ultra marathon, but I think yeah. the kickback, the kickback, like you said, like it's not very often that you're able to to connect the dots between, for example, fundraising. There's a reason why. I, I mean, there's many reasons why I. I both my, me and my partner were so connected to Big Moose, but um, at, at least with, with Big Moose, you know exactly where that money's going. You know that there's a direct route. So by you doing something for that charity, us raising money via whatever way we're going to raise money, we know exactly where that money's going. But not only that, we know how to 
to encourage people to reach out. There's a direct line all the way through the process. So it's a really impactful kind of full circle moment by you putting yourself out there, you growing, you getting like me personally, me getting the help from the charity, but then being able to give back, raise money for others to get that help as well. It, 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 it comes under this same like kind of philosophy with, with I suppose why we run has it as well as that like we rise by lifting others and, and like that circular kind of system with big, big moose really epitomizes it all. It's really, um, yeah, they're incredible. Jeff and Chloe, they're kind of the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing today and in, in, in a roundabout way, they, they've inspired it, like so much of what I've done. So, um, yeah, I can't be more grateful to them. They are really infectious people, aren't they? Hmm. Oh, you Jeff's just... the type of bloke you have a conversation with and you leave like signing up to something that you, you kind of subconsciously wanted to do, but it's it, like you'll let you'll end up leaving signing up for some sort of silly race because he has that way of kind of yeah. Yeah, he le Sorry. leaves like a question <laughs> in your mind about something and you're like, you know the answer. It's like, yeah, I've got to do it now. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's just... dangerous but really empowering. That's yeah. um, you know, one thing I actually took from. Um, obviously, we'll touch on why we run and that, the amazing documentary that you've put out. And again, I'm, I know Nate, Nate will put a link on here. But one thing uh, I watched, um, sorry, that I took on board when I watched it was there's a really, really powerful moment. You know, there's many of them, but there's a really powerful moment when uh, she talks about when she stands at the front. When you guys, I don't remember what day you're on. And um, and she talks about how much money that has been raised so far, and they've worked out the calculations and kind of worked out exactly how many people it was going to help. And I was running on a treadmill at the time, and I I got quite choked up because it's like you said, you see where the money's going, and you see that it's being pumped back into the community to help people. Um, and I don't think there's there's just obviously not enough of that of that around, and we could talk about that for days on end, but to see a charity local doing that it was just really nice it was really good and like i said we we've had a few friends reach out that didn't realize what they did and, and it's helped them already and yeah i just can't say enough or good I think, things uh, i think that's a, a future podcast with jeff and clo yeah 100 come on yeah 100 hmm. percent. Well, yeah chloe's coming on yeah just um one thing I wanted to say, Lou, actually, uh, obviously we mentioned your list of accomplishments here. Uh, you've uh, recently announced that you've been uh, accepted and, well, you got through the lottery to do the Trail de Mont Blanc, mate, or UTMB. I know, it's mental, isn't it? Like, <laughs> that idea, is not the reaction I expected. <laughs> the, the, idea, the idea of, like, running 100 miles with... It's, it's the epitome of kind of this sport, right? That 100 mile is like that that distance that it's the epitome of trail running essentially. And uh, to do it in probably the most historic race in the world, um, so much magic. And I, I was lucky enough to be there last year. I, I was again, lucky enough to get entered through to OCC, which is the kind of the baby ultra. I, I say baby ultra, it's still 54 K with three and a half thousand meters of elevation. And it was, it was just the environment in Chamonix and, and the people that are there. It's, it's just electric. It is it is electric. That is the, the best word I can use for it. So to be able to go back the following year to go and do a distance that still doesn't quite compute on my brain in mind, it's going to be a 30 hour journey. Like I'm going to be probably moving for 30 hours nonstop all throughout the evening. Um, I, I've never done anything like that. Like, yes, yeah. yes, I've done multi-stage races, but a multi-stage race, you'll finish kind of early evening, maybe late evening, but you get to have a night's sleep to recover, get up, you have to eat a couple of times, have it like put your feet up, you get to rest. And don't get me wrong, I'm not taking anything away from those experiences. They're they're absolutely brutal at times, don't get me wrong. But to, to go and run hundred miles in one stint with ten thousand meters of elevation around Mont Blanc, that it it just I, I'm terrified and buzzing at the same time. You know, it's it's uh doesn't quite compute um in I mean, my mind. We'll see. Just we'll running see. through three different countries as well, mate. It's just like, because again, I think you're right. It is the epitome of ultra running, isn't it? And when you sit down and you look at the facts and like how long you're running for and pass through three different countries over 100 miles, and I can't even remember the elevation. It's insane. I mean, you just. It is up I over 10,000 10, meters, yeah. <sighs> I mean, mate, like you said, I can imagine you're on the edge of your seat buzzing, but also like, Shit, what have I got myself into? <laughs> yeah, I've stupidly signed up for an Ironman in June as well. So I've got that to train for as well. So that's uh, 
that's the that's the next thing in in the radar is to to prepare myself for something like that like i'm very terrible i in fact embarrassing on the bike really um i don't really like roads road cycling so um it was kind of a bit one for me to be able to just get comfortable doing something like that but i'm looking forward to going to do that in austria austria in june as well so wow. yeah it's going to be a pretty time intensive training intensive year um but as with these things is they're worth it like a mm. hundred times over um i mean because what you learn about yourself and the experiences that you get along the way the people that you meet just it's um like my experience over the last few years is only positive things that have happened as a result of the of like new experiences like this is um yeah like you we mentioned the word empowering it really is empowering That's so, Luke, for the people who don't really know much about you how yeah. did you start running and so like yeah. it wasn't that long ago was it really no, I think like a lot of people, um, lockdown came around. And and when lockdown came around, like, I was still playing um, rugby. Um, that was my full-time job. It was for 10 years. Um, for, for the last few years of my career, it was very much, I was flogging a dead horse and I'd fallen out of love with the game, had a few nasty injuries and the kind of finite nature of the career really was brought to light in that um, I knew it was never going to last forever. And I, I had half my head in the game, half my head out the game. I stayed year after year after year because it was easier to stay because I knew it was doing rather than to change. Um, and I think like the fit, I, I was too afraid of what, who I was without sport. I didn't know who I was without sport because it's the only thing I did since I was 16 years old. Um, and don't get me wrong, the only thing I did otherwise was I, I trained, I did, I think, eight accountancy exams as I was playing, did a little bit of work experience when I was when I was playing like on a day off every now and again. And I realized quite quickly that that's that absolutely not something I didn't want to do when I retired. So um, it's funny. And I, I look back and I think I probably wasn't, and I'll get to the point of what, when I started running, but like, I think I look back and, Actually, without lockdown, I'm not sure if I would have retired when I did. Um, it was a decision that was kind of made for me. So, and I'm very grateful. For, and that sounds really strange to say that, but I'm quite grateful for lockdown in that sense, because I never would have started running in the way that I did had lockdown not come about. Um, from the last rugby game of the season um, in the March before the world shut down was um, we went up to Newcastle and played against Newcastle and got humped like 40 odd nil. Um, <laughs> so that was my last game of professional sport, retired, bosh, lost 40 nil. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, but yeah, no. So I started running then because obviously no equipment, no, there was no physical outlet. There was nothing. And and I was someone, I'm someone that's I'm into my pants. You know, I'm, I'm active all, all the time. And I was used to training, twice three times a day for the last 10 years basically so have it not having that i needed something to replace that so um as like everyone did i started running um and it the first thing i did actually was i went i god i changed so much in that time but like one of the first things is very egoic i think the first thing i did is went oh, i'll just go and run a half marathon um the, the half marathon I ran off the bat, obviously there was no, it was just on the roads and, and I got injured straight away. I did something to my ankle. It was a very humbling experience. And I don't think I ran for three weeks after that. Um, so I built back up very slowly and, and started again with, I think by then it was, it was May. So there was a thing going around. Everyone was doing 5k a day in May. So I had my half an hour or um, my 35 minutes or whatever a day to just kind of, yeah, to get outside, use that time that we had. That's, like one window of opportunity we had to get outside once a day. Um, but that's when I started in lockdown. Yeah. Wow. Did you find there was a correlation between your rugby career and running? Just interested the way you said, I mean, fair play, you're going straight into a half marathon. It's just typical, typical you. Um, did you find there was like a correlation between, like, did you already have some kind of that strength base from rugby and it's interesting that you said that you you picked up an injury pretty quickly I know it's two very different things but it's crazy because you're obviously a very thick guy playing rugby regularly and training regularly and going to the gym um mm. it's yeah that's it's, it's mad that you can be rugby or match fit but then yeah. rugby, uh, running is so such a What's different it is, it, is a, it is a very different sport but I, I do think there is absolutely correlation um like my like if we think about like training age as a concept my training age was a lot older a lot more mature than a lot of people that maybe took up running for the first time so actually I was able to go from not really like 
not running any long serious long distances to doing quite a lot quite quickly but i actually attribute that not only I, I attribute that a lot to my body's ability to manage stress like my body was used to being hit by a bus every saturday you know i was used to like um again like i said training three times a day and yes it was on it, i wasn't running like you'd be running on the roads so it was a different stimulus but my body still understood and i still had a really solid strength base like i was a strong rugby player and i, th I think probably enjoyed fitness more than i did rugby if i'm honest um so i was avid i was an avid gym go i was in i was really committed to that craft um so when that came to like shifting my perspective from rugby fitness to running fitness I was also interested in how that translated. So I, I, I learned very quickly what the differences were. And, and and because of my experience in rugby as well, I knew what I knew what discomfort felt like. I knew what good pain was versus bad pain. So I had I already had these skills and I think um, and the awareness of like what felt good in my body. So I think those all of that combined really helped me dive headfirst into a sport when really I had no right to. And don't get me wrong, I made I'd made many mistakes, which I'm sure we'll get to in a second, but having that rugby background and and not only from a psychological standpoint from, from a phys physical standpoint as well i was able to i was able to adapt much i think i was able to adapt quicker than others might have because of what i'd done in the past yeah for sure mm. interesting yeah. yeah so you you touched on discomfort there actually that's a good point that we can go back to so Thinking about the runs that you've done, because obviously you've done a lot of runs through, like I know you know Slovenia, Wales, Sri Lanka, Jordan. You've done a, a, you know some amazing two hundred and fifty kilometer runs. Thinking about those long, long list of achievements where you experience different levels of pain and discomfort. How do you personally deal with pain during a race? Like, how is that something like, you know, we we touched on this before, and I know there's people like Courtney DeWalt who would talk about the pain cave and stuff. Personally, for you, when you're on one of these, you know, races and, and it just hits you like a ton of bricks and you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm in pain here, what do you do? Do you positive reinforcement? Like, hey, play with some people literally talk to themselves or is it, like, what's your go-to? um it's evolved over time it has <laughs> evolved over time with experience in every new race like that the way you manage discomfort which is that, that what we're talking about that you you gain new experiences and you, and you actually learn new ways to manage that in different race environments so if i again if, if i start from right at the start <laughs> this kind of probably sums up why i i, I went into the sport so quickly and, and and i'll probably get around to that story in a minute but like i read can't hurt me by david goggins in <laughs> and that for me and and look david goggins like he he's very over the top um but for me at that time that was exactly what i needed to hear it was the i didn't know who i was without rugby so i mean i mean at the time i was i started a <laughs> i started a coconut ball business when i was still playing rugby in 2019 um on the back of a trip um <laughs> Steph and I went to Bali for a month and I left, let's just say I left a stereotypical rugby player and came back a spiritual vegan. Um, but again, that's a, that's a story for another time. But I remember reading Can't Hurt Me um, by David Goggins in lockdown. And I was able to really identify with the story. And I really drew a lot of inspiration from the way he spoke about how he came from absolutely nothing and suffered so much pain or whatever when he was a child but then was able to apply that to a new discipline and really make the most of his life and and it, it was it was all it, so much mindset and so much being able to manage discomfort and i think i really i really drew from that what it like i, I took from that what i needed to for myself and, and i applied it in my own way so um i actually did his um 4448 challenge um in the june um of that year so did the 5k a day and then did the the 4448 um and ended up raising a lot of money for alzheimer's research uk at, at the same time um but the way i kind of the, the way i managed discomfort at that time probably was very goggins-esque it was it was like if, if i if i wasn't suffering then i wasn't moving forward so I, that was very much like what 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 mindset i was in based based on that because that was the first i really read about ultra marathons and 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 how capable we are right like i felt like that book really helped me open my eyes to understand actually wow like we we are capable of so much more than we think you know like why aren't i striving why why can't i do that um so that that challenge and and kind of how i managed discomfort at that time was very different to the way the way i do now i feel like my toolbox is much more um 
nuanced is that the right word i don't know but uh, there's there, there's so many more experiences you can draw from and with every new experience every new unknown you learn a different way to manage things um but um so that was yeah that was that was the june and then um i think managing pain and discomfort as well like it, it, it's not just physical pain and dis mental pain and discomfort as well because in fact in lockdown after i did that 4448 um the pain and discomfort I was feeling wasn't to do with anything physical. If anything, the physical pain was easy because that's what I was used to. But I didn't pre-season for 15 years of my life. I knew exactly what how to manage pain and discomfort because I did it every single weekend with sport. Like you just crack on. Like that was the also like the way that you do it with it as a rugby player and as a man. Like you you're taught to to just not feel. You're taught to just like take it on like take it on the chin like don't be soft like man up just crack on like what like what are you complaining for like that that's the type of mentality that that exists within within sport and and probably for for a good reason and maybe that has, that helped me be a better rugby player it helped me learn how to manage pain and how not to yeah how to keep moving forward when the, the going got tough you know um but there's also a toxic side of that as well where you actually don't reach out for help which would again this is all what this is all about as well. This is the process of and, and this, like where Big Moose comes into it, the process of actually understanding like when is right to reach out for help. And, and a lot of the time reaching out for help is, is the hardest and the best thing you'll ever do. But anyway, I'm going off topic a bit here. Um, so the, the pain, I think that, that during that time that I was really feeling was more psychological because here I was without sport, without understanding who I really was. I was running a business selling coconuts that as much as I loved, like I really loved it. I really loved the values that the brand upheld. I was learning a lot about myself. I was able to, I was able to express myself who, as as who I was be, behind the mask of a business. And it was really, I developed a lot in that time in 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 who I thought I was. But again, it wasn't serving me. I was still behind the desk. It was locked down. I was lonely. Um, I, there was no real sense of purpose. And and most importantly, the business wasn't serving me. I wasn't making enough money to live. So there was there was some real psychological, emotional pain that. Um, and also a lack of awareness that I, I, I didn't realize I needed help at the time. Probably, I probably needed help and I probably needed to speak up, speak up about the way I was feeling, but I didn't know that. Um, and then come the August time, um, this was a couple of months after, after I did the Goggins challenge, um, an opportunity came up. It was about four and a half weeks before, um, Ultra X England and Hannah Talsley, um, was good friends with my girlfriend, Steph, and she'd seen, I'd done, um, she seen I'd done the Goggins challenge. And I think by this point, she knew Steph well enough that she was never going to get Steph like, or convince Steph to sign up to a, to an ultra marathon. So she's like, right. Okay. Lou. <laughs> so she, she, she messaged and she was like, Lou, you, you up for a challenge. And instantly I, ne I needed something because of the pain I was feeling in that moment, any excuse to run away from whatever I was feeling, I needed it. And I had four and a half weeks to train for 125 K ultramarathon over two days in the peak district there's about four and a half meters four and a half thousand meters of elevation um don't get me wrong i did what i could i met a really great group of people in those four weeks um i think i went the training runs were like 18k 28k 40k um and again was able to build up to that point which is mad like without too much um like struggle but i was stood on that start line of this of this race in the peak district and i had no i hadn't I had no idea what to expect. I had no right to be there. I hadn't done the training. I I mean, I said it in a post recently. I really was an imposter at that start line. But I needed it. And I had to, I had to take that risk because the the, the almost the unknown and that like running away was easier than facing what I was dealing with on a daily basis. And I'm and I'm so grateful I did. And and I and I learned I learned more about who I was in those two days in the Peak District than I had. That I had done in ten years as a professional athlete. Like that was, that was how powerful those two those two days were. I mean, I don't want it to sound it like it just. It, I don't want it to sound braggy at all. But like, pain wise, I learned I learned more about pain in that first day. My God, like, um, the and I learned more like about emotional highs and emotional lows. Like at the highest highs, the lowest lows. I was I couldn't understand how I was in so much pain yet when I look, pick my head up and I look around at the peak district and I felt this immense feeling of joy and looking, looking around, be feeling so grateful to be in this situation. Yet next, next thing, you know, I'm like in more pain than I've ever felt before. Yet I was almost possessed to keep moving forward. I, I, it was just this unbelievable concoction of emotions that I'd never, never felt before. 
Um, I mean, I, I tore my calf on day one and I was able to finish the race with a torn calf. I ran 50K on a torn calf. It, didn't, it, it just didn't make any sense. And crossing that finish line, I had, I, had, I had nothing left. I had no energy left to be anything other than what I was in that moment. And this profound experience, like, it was just incredible, incredible on every level. And I knew in that moment when I crossed that finish line, I broke down in floods of tears as, as I did for about five of the races afterwards. It's hilarious. Um, I knew that I wanted ultra marathons to be a part of my life from that point onwards. Um, it was just, I never felt anything like it. Never felt anything like it. Amazing. Mm. So cool. Lou, um, did you know much about fueling at that point? I was, I was eating raw almonds. <laughs> is that I, it i mean i i really didn't know that much but i, I knew that i had to eat um i knew that i had to eat and drink and get some electrolytes in i had no idea how much i had no idea what foods i was trying to eat whole i think i took i think i took a, a bagel with avocado and stuff and whatever in it and because i'd not practiced um and i went way too hard at the gates um i actually didn't keep any food down so i think i lost about 5k in two days um <laughs> I finished, I finished the race and I looked, I looked like a shell of who I was. I was absolutely gone. Like, um, it was awful. Um, I don't want to get too like crude, but the amount of times that I, that things came out of my body from both ends was an obscene amount of times, um, <laughs> to the point. Of, oh no, I, I can't say that on, on a podcast, but no, um, you can, it, it's, yeah. it's all welcome here. Go on. Oh, well, I, I almost shat in front of a couple of kids that would ride in their bikes along the road. Like I was that desperate. I had to like duck out on the side of the road and it was so close. It was awful. I mean, yeah, not good. But in front um, of a couple of kids, like it just uh, it, it just it just proved to me again what I'd read in Can't Hurt Me. I put into practice in those two days. Like I now knew that I could achieve anything that I set my mind to like. I knew mm. that whatever came next, whatever I chose to do, I could do it because I just completed 125k with four and a half thousand meters of elevation training for four and a half weeks. I and I and I didn't keep any food down for and put it politely, I didn't keep any food down for two days. You know, like it, it was just, it was just incredible. And like the idea, like I said, like the idea of what what I now knew I was capable of, it opened my eyes to a new world. Like it was amazing. Um, but as with <laughs> what I didn't know at the time is as with every high, high comes a, a little bit of a low, low. So um, it's funny. I, I, I say that actually the biggest lesson that I learned um, was that you can't keep running away from your mental health, no matter how hard you try, because it was in those weeks that followed that I realized nothing changed. Like, yes. Okay. What had changed is that I've just realized, okay, I can do hard things. Like I'm able to like go and complete these crazy challenges. But for what? If I'm going to come back home and sit behind my desk and look at coconuts all day and nothing's just like what? What? What have I? What have I actually changed? Nothing. Um, and that was the hardest part of the process because, I mean, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have changed on my own. And, and if like the story goes, like Chloe, Chloe actually rung me maybe four weeks after the the race and asked me how it went. And I don't know. I don't know what she picked up in me um she she said um because I, I was already aware of big moose at this point i should probably say that like i we, we steph and i met jeff and chloe um uh, back in 2018 and we volunteered at the super tri uh, triathlon they do um at uic um so we knew all the incredible things that big moose were doing and, and i knew I, I knew graham and i knew the therapist that worked for them um but i never expected i'd be the person reaching out for help um and chloe said in that conversation um lou you know graham's there if you need if, if you ever need graham like he's there for you as well um and as any any kind of bloke would say at the time that was unaware of the way like of, of these feelings and whatnot no that's fine i don't need anything i'm good like give me I'm, I'm absolutely fine like thank you but i'm all good um but again nothing changed like i didn't change anything so those those feelings that i was feeling that the the low that i was feeling it, it just kind of festered and got worse and worse and and i'm i'm grateful and i'm glad that i was strong enough then to acknowledge that and actually ask ask for help um maybe a couple of weeks after that which was the catalyst for all of this um yeah. so yeah what a journey but i'm interested um you probably answered it in a roundabout way Lou, but um 
what is what is your reason why like now so thinking about where you're at now and the runs you've accomplished and everything now and then going back to when you did your first ultra like i think you said it was lake district like what Mm. is your reason why and has it changed from when you first started running to now yeah i think i think it absolutely has changed um I wouldn't have been able to I wouldn't have been able to explain why I was running that first ultra if you asked me back then. I would have no idea. I would just mm. know that it was like an impulse and I needed it, but I wouldn't be able to articulate why I was doing it. It was only when I got the therapy that I was able to realize, well, actually, now I know why. And I I know because if I look back at my rugby career, I felt like I'd failed it. I felt like I'd failed and I'd wasted all this time. I'd left a sport that I trained all my life for and lived and I'd wasted 10 years of my life. That's how that's how it felt. And I was very resentful of the of the person I was in key times in my career where I could have made I made different decisions and 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 I was so caught up in the past and and I resented who I was in that time and then it also reaffirmed that when I had this coconut business that was failing so it was reaffirming those thoughts I thought about myself that I was a failure I was unworthy I was lonely like all of these things so that was what like that was my why First of all, because I need to prove myself that I was good enough. I needed to prove my worthiness to myself. I need to prove that I was capable, but I wouldn't have been able to explain that. Um, but that's shifted now. And, and that feeling really changed after the first um, 250K I did in, it was the following year in August after the, the um, so it's about, it's about, it's about 10 months after, um, it's about 10 months after my first race that I did my first 250K. It was also the first time Ultra X were doing Ultra X Wales. Um, and I, and I did that 250K and it was the first time I really noticed my why changing. Because also I, I, I said to myself after I'd done the therapy to start with Graham, now I know why I ran away to that race. I, I know I know that I was blind, but I know I needed it. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to use 2021 for myself. But I'm, instead of running away from these problems, instead of running away from the pain I was feeling, I'm going to run towards it. And I'm going to run towards it with, with the idea that I'm going to improve my mental health. I'm going to, I'm going to improve my life. I'm going to use running as that tool to, to, yeah, to better who I am, to learn these lessons so that if any discomfort, if anything arises in real life that I can't control happens, I'm in a much better place to, to, to manage it because I know – and. Because I believe in myself, I know that I can overcome these hard things because I've done it, and I choose to do it. Like, I, like choice is a huge thing. Um, and I, I suppose after that 250k, it changed again because I remember finishing at that um, the 250k with a. It's almost like I ticked that box. It was like, you're good now, Lou. Like, like you don't have to prove yourself. You you don't have to prove that you can do any that you can do these hard things anymore because. Like you've just gone from your first ultra marathon to 10 months later doing a five day 250k race. Like not many people will ever do that. And I think, again, I think my ego is probably involved as well. And in I wanted to go from zero to a hundred real quick and prove like there's probably some ego in there, but like, I think the fact was I almost took a breath after that 250k. It was like, you don't have to prove yourself anymore. Like you've, you're good. Like you, you've done it. And I think that was a huge shift in then the, how my why changed because then I'd done it for me, 2021. I proved that, that that was for me. Now, how can I, how can I give back? How can I help others? And that's where, that's what inspired then 2022, which was the raising the money for Big Moose who had given so much to me. I wanted to give back to them. And how, how was I going to do it? Well, I was going to run an obscene challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, that's where the five two fifties was born. So that, that's how my why has kind of shifted over times. It's very much like there was the lack of awareness and then I needed to do something. I need to prove to myself that I was capable and I did that. And then it was like, and also this along the way it changes as well. So like the amount of people that you meet, you do it for the people, you do it for the places that you get to see, you do it for the experiences. Like it's, it's a, it's a multi, like there's so many things that add to those experiences. Um, I met some of the best people I know through these races. Like it's, it's just, it lends itself to people who are like-minded, who want this, who are looking for the same things that you're looking. And you share an experience of an ultra marathon with someone, as Nathan will tell you, like you're friends for life. You might not see these people for 10 years, yet you get back together and that never changes. Um, and that's a really special, that's a really special relationship. But um, 
yeah, I think that explains how the why changes. And I think it mm. just further develops with every experience. That I, I just want, I want to see the world. I want to meet new people. I want to have these experiences. I want to create memories. I want to, I want a lasting legacy that I look I can look back on in my life and think, wow, I, I did that. You know, I, I, I really lived. Um, mm. Well, I'm I'm really going off on one. Sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> Don't apologize, think, man. This is great. You had a post, um, I think it was last week, where you pretty much summed up all that perfectly. Where you've let you've let the experiences of running shape your life and take you to places where you you wouldn't have gone. And the people you met, it's just by accepting to say, "Yeah, I'll do that race," or "I'll go to that run," and mm. it was just perfect. And I think that just sums up why um, people do these crazy races because they don't turn into races, they turn to experience. I think Jen made a good point as well where she said that she wants to experience countries just by running them, um, mm. not racing them. And I, I think a lot of people don't get that. They're all about PBs and hitting times and targets. And they're, mm. they're missing the true value of so like – running in some incredible places. Mm. Yeah. That's I think, yeah, um, that's that's what I would like to do. I'd like to see as much of the world as I can by uh by running it as well. Like go with my wife and my kid and then leave them for a day maybe and just go off and run explore by myself. Like not all who wander are lost and all that. So yeah, that's it's a really good way of thinking about it. I think they I think both exist. I think they I think both because I mean, I'm a really competitive bloke. I mean, I, I don't think um, I don't think I would have probably made it as a as a professional rugby player had I not been really like competitive at my core. But I'd much rather be in competitive. I'd much rather <laughs> the competition with myself than against other people. Um, and I think ultra marathons really facilitate that. Like you, you can you can be as competitive as you want with yourself and whether that's a time goal or whether it's a distance goal or whether it's just completing a race, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. I think you, without tapping into some of that competitive edge, will you ever reach your potential? Cause I think that's another part of it for me. I want to see how good I can be, like how, how good can I become? And that was one of the, um, it was actually one of the quotes that, um, uh, Graham, when I first started having therapy was like, be so good that they can't ignore you like that. That was, it was really something that hit home with me. Like if I, if I just look after what I do, if I can be the best version of me that I can be, the rest will look after itself. It's like, it's a bit like controlling the controllables. Um, so I think I very much agree with the experience. Like you go to a new country, but if you want to compete, you can still compete. But I think with the ultra marathons, especially the multi-stage stuff, what I found is that after day two or day three, God, you've got no energy left to compete against anyone else. It's like, it's, it's just, it becomes a shared experience by proxy of it being so tough. Um, and I think also that's where, why we run is, is really special. And, and that's not to say that you can't have competitive races during the year and something like why we run during the year. Um, why we run is uber special because there is no competition. It's all about getting to that finish line. And actually the competition is for everyone to raise as much money as possible and just people to finish and just, and that, that creates its own special, special environment. Um, but I think you've been missing, I think people would be missing a trick if they weren't to, to really dial into that competitive edge if they choose to. Um, does that make sense? No, it does. Yeah. yeah. Definitely like, you, like the same thing like you, this the coastal path like that's being driven by a competitive edge you're competitive with yourself you, you want to set yourself a goal and a challenge to go and do something incredible and i think without the without that edge it makes it so much harder to do so i think it definitely has its place yeah 100 percent. i think ultra running is about your challenge isn't it rather than for like racing it someone else yeah for sure Sure. Yeah, yeah. I wonder when you're doing this whilst coastal path of obviously you, you know the FKT and everything. I wonder if you'll keep that competitive edge to beat that FKT, or if there'll be a crossover of when you you, you just hit that wall and kind of go, well, now I'm just going to get to the finish line. You know, it, it's kind of like yeah, probably yeah. It. yeah. The aim is overall aim is to, to finish because mm. yeah, just to finish it, but. 
I think it's a chance that you've got to go for the FKT because you might not be able to do it ever again. So the plan's there to do it, but my end goal is to finish. Yeah. Um, no, I'm buzzing you, mate. Question on, on the yeah. multi-stage multi -stage events. I've never done a multi-stage event, actually. Out of curiosity, you touched on earlier on a bit how you had sleep and stuff like that on some of these, unless you're doing UTMB. <laughs> but out of curiosity, it kind of, I suppose it's touching back on like the discomfort and stuff. How do you deal with like um, sleep or lack of it? I've never camped in between sections and got up and then gone again and run a crazy amount of distance the next day. Do you find that you struggle with sleep or because you're so amped up and full of adrenaline or do you find that you just can't get because you're absolutely hanging? I'm curious how and you sleep terribly. that would affect your performance. You sleep absolutely terribly. <laughs> all week um yeah your body's so fight like your nervous system is just ramped up to the max and when you add camping to the mix of like sri lanka for example you're sleeping in a tent with six to eight people it's um even after like when it's dark it's still 28 30 degrees like 100 humidity you're not sleeping i think i think i probably slept an hour a night in sri lanka um and you add yeah you that compounds onto the overall stress that you feel throughout the week though so it, it it's brutal but the body is amazing. The, the body mm. learns. And like you, you're able to just keep going despite like all of these adversities being thrown your way. And that's part of the challenge as well. Like you want to you wanna be challenged. You want you want things to go wrong because that's an opportunity to learn. Like that's an opportunity to grow. That's an opportunity to overcome something that you never maybe thought you could. Um so that's all part and parcel of the experience. And I think it's your it's your job through these multi-stage events is to just control what you can. Like that, again, it's the, it's the same rhetoric that's around on social media, but it is basically controlling what you can. And you know that you have control over how much you eat, how much you drink. You can, you can try and control your sleep, but the chances are that's going to be pretty tough, like considering like the elements and, and where you are and whatnot. But, um, and you can put one foot in front of the other. Like you, you mm. it, as long as, and, and luckily with like, I'm, What's amazing about the events that I've done, like you've been supported along the way. Like Ultra X have such an amazing setup in like there are medics, there are physios, um, there are there are volunteers there to support you throughout the whole experience. And that's where pe the power of people comes into it as well. Like you get to every checkpoint, you feel like you're on the verge of giving up. And the, as you get to the checkpoint, and when you're about 500 meters away, it's a bit similar to why you run when you hear the cowbells, but you get close to the checkpoint and there's like cheers. I'm like, yeah, come on, Lou, let's go, let's go. And you lift you. It gives you mm. another excuse to like, and that's your body language changes, like your energy changes. You get to the checkpoint, you're smiling and the power of a smile when you're buried. Maybe that's something to like, do you know what? That is a good discomfort tool is that if ever you're feeling shit, if ever you're in a real hole, force a smile. Like I'm pretty sure there's something neurochemically, neurochemically that happens. But if you can force a smile in those moments where you feel that you're worse, that is a fucking superpower. Um, and yeah. it really does change the experience. But um, yeah, I've had to use that on many occasions, getting lost and being chased by buffalo and whatever. But that's, um, yeah. <laughs> um, I've just following on from that, have you ever had any hallucinations? I don't from know. From running Maybe. now, from running, not drugs. From running, yeah. We're not talking about your younger years now. Yeah. yeah. I don't um, think you've been a Vegas, have you? I have not. No, I was too young. I had a potential, I had the opportunity to go like um, when I was, playing the dragons and was one of the guys stags but i was 20 not 21 uh almost got fake fake id but i just didn't do it in the end but um no have i had any hallucinations i don't think so not not any really severe ones i, I did think um in ultra x wales the, the second time i did it it was a 34 degree um heat wave so we were kind of um running in those temperatures that was really quite brutal and um i remember looking up or like it was a really steep climb, and I remember getting halfway and really battling in that moment. And I looked up, and I thought I saw the I thought I saw the Ultra X logo in a rock. That was a good close. It was just like it was just chalk. And then as I looked to the top of the hill, you know the styes that you walk over, I thought it was someone like waving at me like this, yeah, yeah. yeah. And as I got closer, it was just the sty that you you climb over. But again, they're like, I've not had any real hallucinations now. Um, you go all the way up the hill, yeah. waving back at them. Yeah, yeah, I know. Um, although, I mean, mid like in the darkness in Chamonix, like what, 15, 16 hours in, we'll see what we see in the woods in the darkness out there. That'll be fun. No, um, you make sure you make a note that I love hearing about people's hallucinations. <laughs> Always cracks me up. 
Well, I can't, I'd rather not. I'd rather not be at the point where I'm hallucinating. I'd rather <laughs> stay on top of my nutrition and hydration to the point where I'm managing my body. But yeah, it, it can happen. Um, things can change. So yeah. Definitely. I agree. Well, it's part of the process, like the lack of sleep and all that stuff, I guess, is something that you have to expect in these races that you might end up seeing some random shit. I mean, it could be really good stuff. It could be a bunch of people smiling and cheering you on, or it could be, I don't know, like Courtney DeWalt or a random, what is it, like a leopard in a hammock or something. She's seen some weird stuff. I don't know. But yeah, I look forward to hearing about yours if you have them. (laughs) So, Lou, we've touched on it already, um, why we run. How did it come about? Okay, so it kind of leads on nicely to where I got to, really. Um, so, the end of 2021, I did that 250k, and by that point, I'd kind of, I was good. I'd, I'd, re- I'd proved to myself that I was capable, and, and my life, and do you know, the, men- the momentum shift in my life as well, not even the running, but my life outside of running really took a turn like for the, like for the better um, as a result of all of the changes I was making and the positive changes that were happening in running, they were also happening outside of running. Um, so I was at a point where I had an opportunity to, to take on a challenge and raise some money for big moose. And it was at the time where um, Jeff and Chloe had the audacious goal of raising uh, a million in, in 12 months um, for Big Moose, and I wanted to be a part of it. I wanted to help. I wanted to give back. And, and if they were willing, if they were willing to do something as big and scary as that, well, you, damn right, I'm going to do something like that as well. So, um, Jeff had the amazing idea of of basically gathering a hundred people, and if a hundred people raise ten grand each, that's a million pound. And I was going to be one of those people, but I wanted to raise a little bit more than that. Um, I wanted to raise 25 grand uh, for Big Moose over the year. And I was going to do that. Um, I went to Ultra X and I asked, oh, guys, has anyone has anyone ever done all five of your 250Ks before? And I can't remember what the answer was. It was something like, oh, well, no one's been stupid enough to do it. <laughs> I am. <laughs> um, so I basically, I, I had the go ahead from those. I'm very grateful to Ultra X. Again, like the support that they've they've given me over the last few years, it's really, they 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 have helped me massively come to this point as well so thank you ultra x but like um they basically provided race entry for all five of their 250ks um which was a massive like massive opportunity for me to go and do these things and they started in march so all in within an eight an eight eight month window uh it was a 250k in sri lanka in march then it was the ultra it was the world championships in june in slovenia which was 250k with 10,000 meters of elevation uh, Wales was in August again around 9,000 10,000 elevation uh, then it was the desert in October so I had, I had the desert in my birthday um, in October and then four weeks after that was meant to be uh, Mexico Copper Canyons um, which was the biggest of the lot it was five five days 12,000 meters of elevation and it was have either of you read, read Born to Run love it yeah, yeah. oh my god so book. so Arnulfo and Manuel Luna ran the race the year before oh. So I was going to meet my heroes. I'd read Born to Run at this time. Like I, Mexico is going to be like the epitome of the year. And that was the real big fundraiser. I'd actually encouraged a few other people to join me as well. So like Leon Bustin was going to come and do it. Rini McGregor was going to come and do it. Uh, and we were going to make this big thing. And they were going to help raise money for Big Moose as well. And like make this big thing in Mexico. Um, anyway, so we did March, June, like... Th- I won't go into depth because there's so many stories. It's so like there's so many amazing experiences throughout these this year. But like in terms of how we run came about, I get to that point. But I remember we were about eight weeks out from Mexico, and uh, I knew I had Jordan and then a three week window to recover before doing another 250 k. So I was already worried about it. Um, and then eight eight weeks before Mexico, I'd only raised six grand at this point. I'd I'd I'd, I'd I feel I felt a bit weird throughout the year about asking to raise too much money because it was obviously so much so long left of the challenge that I mean anything could go wrong. So why might why would I be pushing it so much and raising the money so much where I didn't know if I was going to finish or not? I realize now it was never about me. So I should have just been pushing the money the whole time because it wasn't as if they were paying for me. They were paying for people to get therapy. So it was amazing. But anyway, that's another lesson learned about fundraising. Um, but eight weeks out, Mexico is cancelled. Um, and it was a big blow. Like it was, it was like it really hit me in the gut. Like I was gutted because not only was I not now not able to go to Mexico and have this incredible life experience, which part of the reasons why I was doing it as well. Um, 
but that was meant to be the big fundraiser. It was the last opportunity to raise as much money for big moves as possible. So what 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 the hell are we going to do? Like, um, so <laughs> instead of kind of dwell on it and sit on it, um, decided to take another risk um, and put on my own race. Um, and it had to be three weeks after um, Jordan because the camping season finished on 31st of October and we weren't allowed to like, cause I basically we found a campsite in the middle of Wiltshire and Bradford and Avon. Um, and I booked it for after a week after the season ended. Luckily, uh, Rini was helping me put the, the thing together. So um, decided that we we're going to do a race. Rini wanted to get involved as well. And we teamed up and I rented this campsite in the middle of Wiltshire um, and I asked for help online, um, managed to get 17 other runners to come and join me to finish this 250 K journey, um, to, to Austria. It was, it was like all the old Trek setups. So Sam Heward, the, one of the founders, he, he was the race director. Um, we had two Austrians that worked at Ultra X. We had two medics that worked at Ultra X. We had, um, a bunch of volunteers come. Jeff, Jeff came and stayed the whole week and camped the whole week. And bear in mind, this is like three weeks after Jordan and, We've now got like 25 people at this campsite who are there willing that because I also asked everyone to um, set up their own just giving pages and like commit to raising some money for Big Moose as well as part of that week. Um, and I never expected like how what what happened that week was I, I never expected it. It was it was by accident. It was by absolute chance that this happened. Like there was this was never planned. Um, and I suppose this is credit to like maybe this is what you learned during ultra marathons when sh shit doesn't go your way, you have to adapt, you have to overcome. So this is my way in real life of ad adapting and over overcoming a situation and making the most of a shit situation that could have been awful. It could have meant that we'd never raised that money, but we chose adversity. We chose the discomfort. It was never going to be easy to like put on a, your own 250 K race uh, um, event. Yet people were willing to help like the, the power of people. It really, things like moments like this really help restore faith in people in general. And, and th that week was just so special. Uh, we ended up raising 22 grand in that week and like, but it wasn't even about the money in the end. It wasn't even about the running, like the environment that it created, the love and the support, like we were there for each other. Like it was this support, more pain than, <laughs> than people should be experiencing more tape than I've ever seen used in my life. Yet there was a, stubbornness to quit like there was a refusal because people weren't running for themselves they were running for something bigger than themselves they were running for their the person they were running next to they were running for big moves they were running for people they didn't know that they were going to help like it was just it's crazy it was crazy and it, that i suppose all the way back if, if i can i can trace why we run even back to like when i was playing rugby but really it's back to it's back to that first ultra and it's back to reaching out to big moose for help for the first time. Like none of this would have happened if I hadn't have like done that in the first place, which is really powerful. Um, and yeah, it, that, that's, that's how it, that's how it came to be. But um, I find it hard to describe how special it was. Like, luckily we got a film. So if anyone wants to have a look at the film, <laughs> watch the first film, um, which kind of tells the story. Um, and you, and you, when you watch the film, you see how special, how much it means to everyone during that as well. But um, no, it's, um, yeah, I'm waffling now, but it's a really, 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 I'm really grateful for everything that's happened over these last few years. And, and like it epitomizes like everything that I, that I really value about like, the sport, but about people. And another way I kind of described it was like, I feel like why we run was the the perfect, it was like a, almost like the perfect hybrid between a team sport and an individual sport. Like you had the, the camaraderie, you had the the person like supporting you. You had that, you had that support, you had that common goal that you shared. Yet you also had the freedom to be completely yourself you had the freedom to go and run on your own if you wanted to but you also had the freedom to to wait and wait for your mate if you needed to support them or they needed to support you like there was this they'd be and that that happened because there was no competition other than the competition that you had on yourself to finish the event like that that was it like and it, it just yeah it was like the perfect hybrid of team sport and individual sport um and that common goal to raise as much money for a, for a purpose that was bigger than everyone was 
the common denominator, which just, yeah, transformed the experience. It was amazing. How long after um, number one did you realise that I, I need to do that again because that was quite special? Straight away. Straight away. I, I had no idea how I was going to do it, um, but we knew pretty I, – I mean, I, I knew deep down pretty much straight away that, like, this was – something worth pursuing this was this was something that we really needed to to do again because of the impact it had on people like when you, people were describing it as life-changing like I, I, we just created something that people are going to remember for the rest of their lives um remember having some of the like reading some of the feed because we, we we treated it as a bit of a, an event in the end in that we we tried to make it as professional as we could with the time that we had available um which was not a lot um <laughs> And yeah, probably missed the boat on a few things, but um, the the feedback was phenomenal. Like like life changing experiences uh, were had during that week. So it, it, we would have not only missed an opportunity. That's the wrong that's the wrong way to put it. It would have been a disservice to. I, I guess this sounds so wanky, but it's almost like a disservice to people. Like denying people the opportunity to experience what we experienced that week, that wouldn't have been right. Like because it was so special. Um, so that that's why we like we why we did it again and and also like there nothing really needed to change. Um, we changed the venue and it the, the new venue was absolutely spectacular. Not that the the venue we had was poor. It's just it didn't have that same wow factor. And it was important to me that it was in Wales as well. I'm a I'm a Welshy big moose in Wales. Um, so we found like luckily found a venue um, Celtic Camping to do it again, which is on the coastal path. Like, it was absolutely stunning, um, and that adds another element to the the experience. Like it adds that element of awe, of wonder when you look out to the sea and you realise how small you are in the most positive way. It adds another way to manage discomfort, if if anything, because that feeling of being small, like you realise how lucky you are to be there. So there, there's another. It's just another way. Um, that you it's, it's an, it adds that like um new experience tick box like when you go to the mountains or whatever and you get that feeling you look up and you're like this is insane like you get that feeling in west wales on the coastal path um yeah it's yeah. pretty epic on the scenery yeah yeah and you like heard heard the seals in the bays like there was pupping yeah. season you had like <laughs> wildlife you, like and the sun came out like and just looking out at the sea and feeling like the sea is so big and you're so small. It was just, it has that, yeah, perspective. Yeah, it's one of the best parts of the world. I grew up down there basically in the, in Narvas. My nan used to have a caravan there. So I spent the majority of my life there. And um, it's got a very special place in my heart down there. It's just, I, whenever I go there, I always take my trainers because you can't, you can't visit somewhere like that and not run. You just can't. Yeah. Like, it's just too many beautiful routes and, I've said this many times on the previous podcast, mate. I am utterly jealous and annoyed with myself that I didn't do it because every time I hear about it, I look at pictures, I watch the, the you know the the documentary again, and I'm just like, fucking damn it, why did I get out of that? <laughs> Honestly, man. Like, so uh, watch this space. I promise you, I'll be doing more. I want to. I want to be involved in some way, shape, or form. I'll hold you to that, mate. Don't worry. <laughs> Good. As long as you don't go uh, pulling over and shitting in front of any kids running, because uh, we're not having that. We don't want to be done for indecent exposure. <laughs> Sometimes you just can't help yourself, you know. Like when you got to go, you got to go. <laughs> Better late right than in. <laughs> oh dear. Well, yeah. Sometimes. Did you have imagined, um, <laughs> probably this time last year, that why we went to would have been that epic? Because obviously number one was pretty good. Could you were you worried about not topping number one? Yeah, but I don't. I also don't think it's about topping it. Like I was obviously that, worried that, that we weren't. Yeah. Did we yeah. worry that you might not get that again? I was definitely. It, it definitely crossed my mind. Like we we didn't know whether it was just fluke, whether it was just. Was it the people involved? Was it just the fact that it was the end of a big challenge, or was it, or was this a recipe for something bigger? Um, and did we have we have we nailed it? Like I don't I don't know. And and also I left it pretty late last year, uh, or we we left it pretty late to to organize it with only like three months to go. So I was I was worried people weren't going to sign up as well because it was obviously a requirement for people, and the entry fee was in the form of a. Um, 
was it was a form of raising 500 pound for big moose like via just giving so like i didn't know whether that was going to be a thing or that was going to hinder people i didn't know we'd get the numbers so um i had all the same feelings before that one as i did before the first one all the same anxieties and worries and, and whatever and then you've just got to step into the unknown you've got to just walk through the door right um but it, it and like i said yeah you, you, i was ne i don't think it was ever about re replicating the first experience because it, it, nothing it wouldn't nothing's ever going to replicate that experience and nothing's ever going to replicate why we run two like they were both absolutely insane in their both ways in their both ways like they were both so special so powerful um and it's the same with why we run three it's going to be different there's there's going to be different people there's going to be a like i think even the, the group of people changes everything so um but now i'm not as worried about like whether it's going to be a special because i know it'll still be a special because we've proved it twice now um but i was what yeah i suppose i was worried to answer your question i just didn't know what it would look like how, how different it would be um does that answer your question I yeah don't know Actually, I'm curious, with why we run three, are there any little secrets or nuggets of information that you're going to throw out there that you've kind of, uh, that are going to be involved with this, that uh, here's your platform to talk about, that uh, maybe like, um, I don't know, just like... I suppose, um, I suppose I, obviously, every year we want to try and make it better and better. But I think better and better for me um, and for us as a, as a team now, which is amazing, is is how well we can support people through the process. Cause a, a lot of, it's a very raw, open and vulnerable week. So part of improving these, these events is to, to listen to the feedback and to make necessary changes based on the feedback. So this time, because the conversations and, and some of the, the topics we spoke about was so raw and vulnerable, like what, what we're, what we're doing a little bit differently this time is we've actually organized um, some specific workshops, pre-event, mid-event and post-event that will help support people with um, the psychology of running an ultra marathon, um, which I, th which I think is a really um, amazing addition. And it's not something that, and it's not something that any other race companies are offering. So in the lead up to, to why we run this time, we'll have three workshops um, with a sports psychologist um, taking people on like learning techniques and how to manage discomfort, ironically, um, mm -hmm. and how to like basically organize their thoughts when when problems arise and whatnot during races. Uh, three different topics for those three different um, sections during the race. Um, our sports psychologist is going to be there with us as well to reaffirm all of those tools um, just to make sure people remember like how to, to manage those situations. But I think most importantly is with big events like this, there are, there is always a bit of a period afterwards in the, like you have such a high high, it's not always natural that you're going to have a low low. So what was more important to us is that people were supported in that period. So we're going to have another workshop post event that's going to help runners um, navigate those post race blues. And, and ultimately to, because I tried to do it this year with why we run. I, I remember sending an email out to people as a bit of a reflection, a bit of a, a bit of a reflection statement where they can kind of process their thoughts, write down what they've learned about themselves or about the event during, during the week and, and how they can use that in day to day life. Because I think that's where part of the, the like that's why that's part of why we do it as well. We want to grow as individuals. So without identifying those things that you learn during the race, like how, how are you moving forward? How, like, otherwise, you're back into the situation where you just get back to your death and nothing's changed. So having someone there to support people through those post-race reflections and the, the, the post-race blues is going to be really important. So I suppose that's the, the biggest change this year. Um, and I'm also going to coerce my dad into doing a gig on the last night as well. Uh, oh, nice. that's class. Yeah. That's class. Make fair play to you. That, that post-race blues, blues thing, you've, yeah, you've, you've hit the nail on the head there. That's really good because the one thing that has been a very consistent comment throughout any of these podcasts speaking with Jen and Sophie and Nathan as well is that everyone just was just so they felt like they could have done another five days they didn't want it to end so to have yeah. like that support post race where you can say look let's chat about this talk about this and appreciate what we've just done and achieved and and take away a very different attitude 
in comparison to what you maybe would take away if you didn't have that support. And I feel like that's that's probably moving forward something that a lot of, of race organisers should adapt into it because it's, yeah, I mean, people are on this very raw, vulnerable week, like you said, getting to meet new people and experiencing the highest of highs. And all of a sudden it's just like, bang, no more. Where do I go from here? So yeah, that that post race support, yeah. and then obviously if your old man agrees to to play a gig as well, <laughs> fair yeah, play. He, he loves it. He will. <laughs> will quite... you get Steph to come down and run? I wish. No, no. I, Steph, um, Steph will be there. She she's the ultimate support. Like she's been incredible these last few years, and I wouldn't have been able to have done what I've done without like full support from that side. In the same way that I'll fully support everything that she does. Like it's uh, it's that kind of the key to a successful relationship, right? If if I have an idea and I want to go and pursue something that's really important to me, um, then I know she'll have my back and vice versa. So yeah, she she'll be there to support. Um, I'm gonna try and coerce her into doing some running. She she will. I don't think she'll do the whole thing though, but I think she'll do a couple of loops for sure. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, man. Behind every strong man is a stronger woman. <laughs> you say that again. Yeah. Hell yeah. It's a shame, it's a shame I'm not like face to face because all I want to do is give him a hug. Oh, <laughs> won't be long. Won't be long. You were um, uh, April fourteenth. Yeah, and there. Uh, yeah. Sweet. Well, what, is yeah. that the? Is that the? motivational night or is that the ultra fun run big fun run fun run yeah, yeah i need to sign up to that i need to sign up to that. i want to do young and assume when you're both doing the ultra no i'm oh. not um i'm supporting my boys doing the 10k and the wife was doing half oh okay fair um, I'm, are I'm you not, running not not really well, sure. i'm running but i'm not really sure what time everything's kicking up and starting so i don't know if it's clashing or anything but you never know i might just turn into an ultra i don't know <laughs> <laughs> what about yourself Lou? are you doing the ultra I'm not doing the ultra, no. No, I've got a, um, the week after that, because uh, it's April, right? Yeah, the week after that, I'm in um, Valencia for a half Ironman. Oh, God. Mm. I know. I was trying to go for that. I'm going to go as far to say that time-wise, it's harder than training for any ultra I've done. Even now. <laughs> We're at like the starting stages, like multi, like training for three different disciplines. It's so time consuming. It's ridiculous. Um, and don't get me wrong, I've, 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 I've got a coach for this as well, a new coach. Um, I think that there is so much value in coaches having coaches um, to like learn new perspectives and also just to outsource that, so you don't have to worry about it. Like, you're, otherwise, I'd be worrying about my own training all the time, and I just don't have the mental bandwidth to be doing that. Um, but um, even now. And I've told them that I want to be competitive. I want to really see what I can achieve now with Ironman, um, having not really done any biking before. And I, I mean, I did a half Ironman last year, um, off, like in Vancouver Island, my brother, because he lives in Vancouver. We went out and it was that experience. It was, it was incredible. Um, and I think I rode my bike five times. Um, the longest ride was like four days before the actual race. And it humbled me. So, um, but even now, like I'm doing 11 hours of training a week already um and i'm not even into any sort of peak volume um so it's uh it's pretty tough on a time on a it's a big commitment but i'm 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 ready for it and i'm excited for it and it's not that i'm not aware of 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 that time commitment it's just uh it's going to be a lesson in how to properly manage time um which is going to be fun but um yeah Amazing. It's cool. i've heard that I've heard that it's a with with Ironmans, it's just a different ball game altogether, and it like you said, you got those three disciplines, and yeah, finding time to do it, man. That's a that's a skill in itself. I think I was actually going to ask you yeah. if, if you had your own like because obviously you're ultra coach and everything as well. So I mean, it's like, do you have you got your own for this, and also have you had some for any previous runs, or do you kind of plan those yourself? Yeah, so um. When I when I did the five two fifties, I had a coach and he was brilliant. Um, kind of one of the biggest lessons I learned. Um, and it's important to me to work with people that know more than I do. <laughs> so I, I I was very lucky to have a fantastic coach that year in in Luke Tybersky. Um and he he's I mean he's done all sorts of incredible challenges. Um, I think like a, a two thousand kilometer triathlon or something is ridiculous. But um, from Monaco to Monaco, uh, yeah, from Morocco to Monaco or something like that. But um, he uh, yeah. he was 
he was influential in in that year for me because the biggest lesson I learned was less is more in training. Like really, every 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 race was a training run for Mexico or for why we run. And now we know. Um, so it was just about managing my volume throughout the year and, and also realizing you don't need to do masses amount of volume to be prepared for these races. Um, and yeah, so, so it's important to me that I have, when, when, when I'm undertaking races and challenges that are potentially new to me or something I'm really committed to that I want to do really well in, then yeah, absolutely outsourcing that part of the process to someone who, who, who can help or is, is more knowledgeable than I am. So I'm able to learn as well. It's really important to me. So, um, yeah. And like I said, from a time management standpoint and from just being able to like have someone to hold you accountable, like it's all the same. It's, I'm, I'm a human being like and all of my other athletes I, I use, I have coaches to help hold them accountable and to make sure they're doing the right thing. It's the same for coaches. Um, one of the hardest things is to, uh, is to, um, oh, what's the saying? It's do as I say, not as I do. One of the hardest things is to lead by example and do the right thing. Um, mm -hmm. Having someone in your corner to make sure you're doing that is actually really, really important, I think. Mm. Well, that's, uh, that's been awesome. I mean, Nathan, unless obviously you've got any other questions, I feel like we should let, uh, let Lewis get onto bed and uh, he's going to be up early, I'm sure, doing a swim and a cycle or something tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we'll let you go if you want, Lou. Yeah, yeah. Um, just thank wanted, you very much. Thanks, yeah, Lou. Thank you so much, mate. But, uh, it's been a pleasure to speak to you properly. And like I said, I'm sure we'll have many more face to face meetings in the in the future and what have you. But uh, it's been a pleasure to get to know about your journey more. And for anybody who's listening, I hope you've enjoyed this. And uh, feel free to check out his Instagram, Lewis, if you want to see what yours is. We can they can track your journey. Yeah, it's just um, Lewis underscore Robling um and if you want to have a look at why we run it's just at it's why we run um there you go go over and check it out amazing thank you guys i really appreciate it no nice one lewis Great appreciate you man uh, Lou. Look after yourself. good luck on your training cheers take care uh, bye um so i'd like to just add in the fact that every week we talk about inspirational runners we found on instagram this week um, this week, I think it's only fitted for us to talk about three people that we know who have just finished the Arc of Attrition, which is a 100-mile um, run around the coast of Cornwall. Um, so well done to Heidi, Lauren and Michelle, all finishing um, 100 miles. Well done. Great job, yeah. guys. Crap. That's Smashed it. Brutal run as well. That Arc of yeah. Fair play, that's... You and, beast. Uh, Michelle is actually um, doing the Welsh Coastal Path as well this year in June. <laughs> as you do. Why not? I mean, yeah, you didn't it's a 100 mile warm up for it, which is amazing. 100 mile warm up in some brutal conditions just before yeah. doing a, a very small 800 plus mile. Yeah, as you do. Um, on that note, I did want to say also um, about inspirational things uh, and, and people, I guess. Uh Slightly different topic, but also associated with running. Uh, simply underscore Rods. So Rods is one of the co-founders of Running Punks. <clears throat> Excuse me. Him and a guy called Matt, Matt Ignition. They, um, they've done a lot to bring the community together through, through Running Punks. And something they've done to bring the community together more is they've actually uh, opened up like a little coffee shop in Cardiff, in Tonguin Lice. So if nobody knows about it, um, they've got their own coffee called First Light and they've got an Instagram page at Your First Light. Um, they had the launch of the coffee shop on Saturday, which uh, I went along to with my wife and boy. And uh, it's just incredible. And for anybody who runs around Cardiff, um, up to the Garth, around Castle Cork, you'll all know the route. Um, their coffee shop is at the bottom of Castle Cork, so you can stop on your way up or on your way back and have a coffee. But I just wanted to put it out there because they put a lot of work into it and it's a fantastic little coffee shop. And um, yeah, like I said, it's just bringing in more community and a really good location. So I wanted to give a shout out to them because they've done some amazing work. So well done, guys, for that. Because I know you were like bedridden for four days, weren't you, last week? Well, a lot better now. Um, I haven't been for a run yet. Um, going tomorrow, doing hills. Um, doing loads of gym, man. I know. Did loads of gym. I did fucking, what did I do the other day? Um, 75 sandbag lunges, 25 kilos. Uh, 
followed by um, 70 um, RDLs with kettlebells, um, 40 70. kilograms. Yeah. Um, so seven sets of 10. <clears throat> um, then I did that, um, the, the fucking the ski. Oh, the one you said. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, ten minutes ski, so like just over two thousand meters, and then straight onto the bench. That was all. Oh, that was weird. That was. Uh, by there, it was like, oh god. What yeah, that's we... why um, I said to you, were saying it's good but dangerous because I feel like you'd go hard on the ski erg, and then your arms would be like jelly. You'd end up dropping yeah. the bar on you. <laughs> I'd give my face lift, give myself a face lift. Yeah, so I did the same again today. So uh, I'm going out on tired legs tomorrow. Nice man. Thank you so much for everybody who listened to episode five of the Just Run podcast. We had a great time talking with Lewis and I hope you all enjoyed it as much as we did. Tune in next week for the next episode and it's going to be a team episode. Our first one with Jen and Sophie, who we've had on previously. And we're going to cover off some really important conversations um, about women in running, you know, um, boundaries, safety, that type of thing. Uh, I won't go into too much detail. I'll leave that open and, uh, yeah, keep you guessing. So tune in next week, and thanks ever so much for listening. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.